as we watch the numbers tick up. Just a couple more moments and we'll get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Cates. I'm based in Phoenix, Arizona, representing National Review Institute as the Regional Development Lead for the Southwest. Members of our team are located throughout the US, including my colleague Jason Wise in Seattle, who covers Northern Nevada and California, as well as the Pacific Northwest. National Review Institute, or NRI for short, is the journalistic think tank founded by William F. Buckley Jr to bring the conservative message to increasing numbers of people through beyond the pages of National Review Magazine. Our mission includes preserving and promoting the legacy of Bill Buckley and supporting the top talent of the magazine, including our popular and insightful writers like Annie McCarthy, Victor Davis Hanson, and our speaker today, Ramesh Panuru. We frequently join forces with our friends in the State Policy Network as we are today with the Nevada Policy Research Institute. And in doing so, we can reach people where they are with discussion on issues unique to their region. So we thank you for joining us for this regional partnership event between NRI and NPRI to discuss the impact your governor's shutdown orders have had on the Nevada economy and what that means for public policy moving forward. We'll talk about the federal and state government's response and what can be done to rebuild and preserve the freedoms necessary for a vibrant Nevada economy. And speaking of the economy, NRI has a public event coming up on Monday morning, October 26, in which Andrew Studdiford and Kevin Hassett will discuss the Biden-Harris economic plan and the long run impacts of its regulation, taxes and spending. This will be a good breakdown of the details of the Biden agenda and how they will affect you no matter where you are on the economic ladder. Please go to our website, nrinstitute.org and click on the events tab to find the link for Monday, October 26 and register for this complimentary event. So a little about our speakers before we get started. Ramesh Panuru is a senior fellow at National Review Institute and a senior editor at National Review where he's covered national politics and policy for 20 years. His articles are also frequently published in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Ramesh is a key contributor to NRI's new project to defend and celebrate the free market called Capital Matters. Michael Schaus is communications director at the Nevada Policy Research Institute and is responsible for managing NPRI's messaging with the public, the media, and the membership. Michael has worked in media for about, uh, as a national columnist, uh, a political humorist, and a conservative talk show host in Denver, Colorado. For today's call, our speakers will introduce the topic for about 20 minutes, and after which uh, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. So if you're joining us online, you're welcome to ask a question in the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, moderate that portion of the event. And for right now, I'll turn it over to Ramesh and Michael. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. A quick word about Nevada policy for those of you who maybe came to us through the National Review uh, side of things. The way I describe our work is we work to preserve and expand the freedoms that are necessary for human flourishing. So we really focus on things like educational choice, uh, worker freedom policies, low taxes, of course, and, and government spending and transparency. So needless to say, the last seven, six, seven months have been pretty, pretty taxing on us. Um, it's been, it's been very interesting watching everything unfold, and it's been honestly kind of discouraging seeing how quickly government and politicians have been leaning towards authoritarian tendencies. Uh, from the very beginning of the Sisolak shutdown, as we call it, we were pretty much the only voice out here in Nevada talking about how we should be able to have individual freedom and free markets and a response to the pandemic at the same time. There's no reason why those two things should be mutually exclusive. And of course, as the two weeks to flatten the curve turned into six months of ongoing arbitrary orders, we've really realized that we have to step up some of our efforts and talk about some of these bigger issues. Um, what we have right now is actually a really great opportunity to get a lot of our policy ideas or policy perspectives in front of people who normally would not be paying attention. 
uh, we have that opportunity because this is one of those rare cases where government overreach isn't some uh, abstract concept that you have to kind of talk about in a vague way. It's impacting people very directly. We've got a lot of people unemployed. We've got businesses being crushed. And we've got arbitrary orders pretty much every week coming from the governor's office that is making it very difficult for people to live their lives. So I'm very excited to be able to talk about looking forward, some of the things on the national and state level that are gonna be impacting us and that we are gonna to have to be prepared for. Some of them are opportunities and some of them are definitely challenges. Uh, so to, to, uh, to that point, I guess I'll throw it over to you, Ramesh, and have you introduce yourself a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at uh, the National Review Institute and my new friends at Nevada Policy Research Institute and all of you who are joining us virtually. I'm sorry um, that it has to be a virtual meeting. Would love to be uh, out in uh, Nevada, although one of the potential downsides from um, doing this instead from my basement is uh, uh, we've avoided because the toddler is taking a nap. So there, there won't be, there's no danger of, uh, of him Zoom bombing us um, to, to fly a toy plane or something. Um, although who knows, maybe that would have been then better than, uh, than my talking about uh, the mismanagement of uh, government. Um, certainly it would be cheerier. Um, so as, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I am a senior fellow at the National Review Institute and I've been writing for National Review for a good quarter century now. And I cover a lot of topics, including a lot of economic topics. And I thought today what might make the most sense would be to talk about some of the ways that the federal government and the state government are interacting because there are actually quite a few live issues right now related to let's say, fiscal federalism. Um, and uh, we're going to probably be hearing a lot more about them in the weeks before the election and also in the weeks after the election, um, regardless of, uh, of who wins the presidency, who wins the Senate. One of the sticking points right now in the negotiations, if that's the right word, over a another COVID relief package is how much in aid to state and local governments there should be. Uh, the, um, uh, that's been a bit of a moving target. The Democrats have been uh, tended to have tended to talk about numbers that end with a T, um, you know, in the, in the trillions for how much aid they believe is justified. The Senate Republicans um, initial COVID relief package didn't include anything uh, in state and local aid. And therefore, you know, we had a pretty big, um, difficult divide to bridge. I think that in theory, the, the case for giving some money to state and local governments is state and local governments are facing an economic short, uh, excuse me, a revenue shortfall and, and, and in a higher demand for spending in some ways because of the pandemic and the associated economic costs. The federal government has greater borrowing capacity than states and localities, and we don't want in the middle of a weak economy a drastic cut in state employment or services. And even more, I would say we don't want increases in state taxes. Um, so that would be the case for, but of course the danger is that you get a, a bailout of uh, uh, irresponsible state and local government decisions. Uh, and this leads to more such irresponsible decisions going forward. And it unfairly penalizes people in states who have voted for better governments uh, and have made the right civic decisions. The thing that a lot of Republicans uh, have been talking about specifically is state pensions. Uh, Mitch McConnell brought up a few uh, months ago the, the idea that we're not gonna do a bailout of blue state pensions and, uh, and a lot of people came down pretty hard on him. Um, even, even Republicans, Pete King of um, uh, Long Island, if I remember correctly, uh, the member, longtime uh, House Republican called him the Marie Antoinette of the Senate. Um, but I think that, that, uh, that McConnell's got, uh, there's a lot to be said for McConnell's position in this um, because there has been a lot of mismanagement of state pensions. 
since the early 1990s, private pensions have kept on reducing their projections for their returns in line with the reduction in interest rates. Public pensions have tended to keep them just like where they were in the early 1990s. You can only achieve those kinds of returns if you are taking on big risks. And if you are taking on those risks, then the, the right thing to do from an accounting standpoint would be to have a risk adjusted return. But what we have instead is this endemic problem where politicians want to make promises of benefits, especially to important constituency groups like public sector unions, but they don't want to tax people up front. They don't want to have an on budget cost. So what they'll do is they'll promise benefits in the future. And they are attempting to square the circle through what through kinds of accounting practices that in the private sector would probably get you thrown into jail. Um, and I think McConnell's absolutely right to draw a line and say that that isn't something um, that we want to see done. I think there's actually a good case for what he was talking about in terms of having a bankruptcy option for state governments, which we already do for local governments. Um, but uh, it's pretty hard to see House Democrats going along with that proposal. So I suspect, and we, I'm perfectly happy to talk about that idea in the in uh, uh, the rest of our conversation. But I suspect that the reason McConnell put it out there was to help draw that line to say, no, we're we're not going to have um, an unlimited bailout for uh, for state and local governments. And I'd also say that some of the revenue projections are it's looking a little. Uh, it's, it's looking a little better than it had been a few months ago, particularly at the local level, because we've had something of a residential property boom. Um, and, uh, and so property tax projections are suggesting that things are actually going to come in better than uh, um, a lot of these governments have thought, which is, I guess, mixed news for homeowners, um, but, uh, uh, but does lessen that need. Uh, and I guess strengthens the Republican negotiating hand in these negotiations. Um, one other thing that's, uh, that's worth talking about is the um, uh, state and local tax deduction, which, um, as you may recall, when Republicans passed a major tax reform at the end of 2017, and the Republican Congress at the time, and then Donald Trump uh, as president signed it, it put a cap on the state and local tax deduction of $10,000 and uh, Democrats have been uh, have been hopping mad about this and vowing to overturn it. Um, they want the, the old unlimited state and local tax deduction. And they've included that unlimited state and local tax deduction in the uh, House Democrats version of a COVID relief bill. Now, so there, there are arguments pro and con on the state and local tax deduction. I'd be for actually getting rid of the whole thing uh, and using the proceeds to, uh, to cut the overall um, level of taxation. Because I do think that it ends up being a subsidy from states that have smaller governments, lower spending and lower taxes, to states that have higher spending, higher taxes, and bigger governments. And, and I don't think that that's, um, that's something the federal government should be encouraging. But I understand there are arguments on the other side. What there isn't an argument for is including this as part of COVID relief. Because basically, by uncapping this deduction, what you are saying is, at this moment of national crisis with so many people unemployed, our big national priority should be helping uh, affluent homeowners in high tax jurisdictions. Um, you know, And there's, uh, there's, there's no particular reason to think that um, the high earners of California are particularly deserving of, uh, of COVID relief compared to other people. So that to me is a real tell of just how unserious um, the democratic legislating on this issue is and how much of it is, uh, is really just um, partisan positioning uh, and, and, and frankly, making a play for their own campaign donors. Again, I'm against them on the on the underlying issue. We could have the debate about the underlying issue. There is no reason to, to tie that wagon to COVID relief. Yeah, and I, I actually think you're right. You, you said something earlier that uh, really jumped out at me and you were talking about the federal bailouts, mm. basically rewarding 
uh, states that have been acting irresponsibly financially. That's that's definitely something really worth watching because here, the first stimulus, when that first came around, a lot of the money that went to Las Vegas, for example, they spent on hazard pay for employees that had stayed home during the initial part of the shutdown. Um, uh, City of Henderson, uh, they got some uh, money as well, and they ended up expanding their headquarters and, and creating this whole you know big construction project rather than, I don't know, trying to fill some of the holes in their budget with that money. Um, and there are significantly larger issues at play. What the, what the pandemic has really done and what the economic costs we see from the shutdown, one of the things that that has done that's kind of a gift in a really twisted way is it has helped us highlight some of these fundamental failures. Um, here in the state of Nevada, we've got unemployment, uh, an unemployment office that is in absolute disarray. There are people who filed unemployment six months ago. They still haven't gotten their checks. Uh, they haven't gotten their benefits. And that type of failure of government, I think, it allows us to highlight that type of failure of government because it's directly impacting people. But it's also important to remind folks, yes, the state certainly is going to be short on cash, just sending in a bunch of federal dollars. That's not going to fix any of these fundamental issues that are making things worse right now. It's not going to fix the uh, influence that the teachers union has over whether or not kids go to school uh, in person. It's not going to fix the issues that we have with governments lobbying for more money at the state capitol. Uh, so it's really important that we try to focus, focus people's attention on the local efforts first. And I'm afraid that the federal bailouts really going to kind of push all that aside. How likely do you think it is that uh, there's going to be some sort of a sizable federal bailout in say the next couple of months? Or are we really just looking at after the election, after uh, you know January sometime, is that when we're going to be getting serious about some sort of a stimulus 2.0. So Nancy Pelosi has been saying she's optimistic about reaching a deal and um, what she calls optimism is not always what, what I would uh, describe as optimism. The thing is though, um, we have to be realistic about this. If there is a deal and you know this is what COVID relief phase four, I believe people are calling it, doesn't mean there won't be a phase five, right? I mean, so let's say there's a bipartisan deal signed by President Trump, and then let's say Biden um, gets elected with with a Democratic majority in the Senate, then I think, you know, you could very, very easily see um, in January and February a debate over, you know, phase, let's combine phases five and six and make something even bigger. Um, so I would say there's a pretty strong chance um, that there is a lot more federal spending in our future. I mean, we've, we've seen a collapse of what little fiscal discipline there was at the federal level and in both parties before the pandemic hit and um, let alone now. I, if you don't mind, I want to I just mention, what, key off one thing that you said. It is interesting how you, know, you talked about, I've, I've talked about the, the mismanagement of public pensions and how that the, the public sector unions play into that. You, you've mentioned the teachers unions and how in, in some ways they impede the right school policy. It just really strikes me how many of this year's problems are really throwing a light on the ways in which public sector unions have interests that are not the same as the public interest. And, and you see this sometimes pop up in, in, in odd ways where you've seen so many liberals and Democrats in the context of protests against police misconduct or alleged mis police misconduct saying, you know, well, these police unions, they're, they're, are, they're get, getting in the way of useful reforms as though they're the only unions that have ever done that. Um, and I think we have also seen that um, you know, just as there are a lot of great police officers, just as there are a lot of great teachers, the, t the teachers unions can be a real obstacle to getting our kids needs met. Uh, and, you know, again, not everywhere, um, but there has definitely been some resistance. There's been resistance not only to doing in-person schooling, but there's been even resistance to doing virtual schooling. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the idea that, that, look, I mean, I suppose in a way it's, it's totally reasonable to want to get paid for not doing the job. Um, uh, that's I, I've been trying to do that for years. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, um, you know, but I think, but if we, if we learn something from this, hopefully it'll be, um, just because 
you are in the business of providing an important service doesn't mean your union is something that we should just look on and think, oh, they're the good guys. Yeah, and, and we should remember, uh, it was in 2015, Nevada passed the most universal school choice program the nation's ever seen. And of course, it went through the courts. And then by the time it got out of that, it was never funded because the opposition to it had taken over the legislature. Um, the reason why I bring that up is because the teachers union, the, the fiasco that we're seeing in education right now, thanks to COVID, is 100% should be laid at the feet of the teachers union. They are the ones that lobbied for virtual learning, and that virtual learning has been a complete fiasco uh, from the very beginning. The very first day of school, about a third of uh, Clark County School District students had no access to the online learning. That's the fifth largest school district in the nation, and a third of the students couldn't do it effectively. And there's a report out now where uh, school districts are saying they expect only an 11% proficiency in math for eighth graders by the end of this year. Uh, that's almost 90% of kids won't be a grade level with math. And I don't care if uh, Clark County School District or Washoe County School District or anybody else wants to be virtual if there's some sort of choice for parents that think that's not working for them. Um, and teachers unions have been the ones that have stepped in the way of that. And even getting outside of education, uh, you mentioned pension reform. That's something that we have been at the forefront of in, in this state for a very long time that 100% lies at the feet of unions, the reason why it's not fixed. And you're seeing this in basically every sector. And this, this moment in time gives us the perfect opportunity to talk about that because parents generally have a good view of teachers unions because they like teachers and they want good schools and they think of the education as a benevolent system. Right now they are seeing that the system's not working for them and they wanna know why. And, and when you're able to demonstrate to them why, they're going to figure that out. And they're going to start actually calling for some change. Um, it's, it's definitely something that, uh, you know, we've been focused on heavily, but I think that... Yeah. Can, can, I, add, can I add one point to that, uh, Michael? Yeah. I, I do think that the, that's, that's right. The other thing is you were talking about the, uh, the costs of virtual school um, for kids. Just let me just point out, those costs are not evenly distributed. They are wildly disproportionate um, in, in harming the kids of poor households, kids where there is maybe only one parent, or where you don't have parents um, who speak English and can help with the kids with the homework, because we're all having to be, you know, the principal and the lunch lady and the teacher um, to a large extent, and not all households are equipped to do that as easily. Uh, not all households are as high tech uh, or as tech savvy as each other. So the, the losers of this moment educationally are predictable. Yeah, and, and that's also the same when you move outside of education, you start looking at the way that we're reopening the state or not reopening certain sectors of the state. Um, you, you have the same problem. There are a lot of folks who, you know, I've, I've been very privileged in as much as I can work from home. And so I have been working from home and my income has not really been disrupted. A lot of people don't have that opportunity, especially in a state such as Nevada, where so much of our economy is dependent on hospitality and service and tourists coming in and having grand wild events on the strip. When those things aren't happening, a lot of folks don't have a lot of other opportunities. Um, so again, that, that goes down to those foundational issues that it's more than just, and I think this is what's missing in the federal conversation when we're talking about the next stimulus or the next bailout, we get so hung up on what's the total price tag. And I think we should be focusing a little bit more on kind of what McConnell was trying to do when he brought up pensions. All right, price tag is one thing. The bigger question is how do we make sure this makes a difference? Uh, moving forward. So that way we don't find ourselves in the same situation next time governors declare an indefinite state of emergency and start micromanaging the economy. Right. And, you know, one thing that we should be looking at as well is uh, how much executive authority should there be? How much discretion should there be? There's, and this is at every level of government. You see this at the federal level too, where um, these, uh, these open-ended grants of authority go from legislatures 
um, from in the federal case from Congress to the president. The president can decide he wants to raise tariffs on anybody for any reason he wants to, basically. Sometimes he has to put a fig leaf on it um, or declare a national emergency, as we've seen. And I, I, you've got similar grants of power that have enabled governors um, to, uh, to, to really indulge whims uh, in the context of fighting the pandemic. Now, that doesn't mean there shouldn't be any emergency powers. You never need executive discretion. But I do think that, that it would be wise to use this experience to look back and think about maybe there are some places we need to tighten this up um, so, that, uh, so that we have something closer to a rule of law and not a, a rule of men and women specific well, individual men and women. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the easiest ways to do that, by the way, and it's something that, uh, you know, we've looked at here in this state, and I know a couple of uh, lawmakers have already proposed something along these lines, but it's just limiting the duration of how long an emergency power can go without the legislature's involvement. Because uh, one of the problems that we've had, it, when everything first started and Governor Sisolak declared the state of emergency, We'll, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt that things were chaotic. We didn't know a whole lot about the virus. There was a lot of confusion out there. So he took action. That was supposed to be two weeks. Uh, here we are months later, and he just a few weeks ago finally allowed us to have more than 50 people in the church. And, and that kind of arbitrary you know, micromanaging of, of the economy with no end in sight creates serious problems because business owners cannot plan uh, Private citizens can't figure out what they're going to do for, say, their child's education. Uh, having just some sort of a democratic process where maybe state of emergency lasts two weeks before you have to call a special session and get it renewed, something like that. Um, and, and you're absolutely right on the federal level as well, because we see this all the time where Congress will pass the Let's Make Everybody's Life Better Act and then say to the executive branch, please fill in the details and create regulations. And that, I hope, is something that a lot of people are waking up to. Do you, I mean, do you think people kind of draw that connection that, hey, this is an undemocratic process and maybe that's just as big a problem as the actual shutdown orders that are being made? Well, you know, I think that there are, there, people have a lot of frustrations uh, with the situation. And part of the task of political leadership is to channel those frustrations in a constructive way. Um, I think that the door has been open to making these points um, that, that we've been talking about, uh, about the need to have a little bit more control of the people who are trying to control us and of uh, the, the problems inherent to public sector unions, for example, the need for greater school choice. But I think, you know, the door's a little open, but somebody has to actually walk through it. Uh, and, and you do need people like your institution, but also like political leaders um, to make those points. And I'll tell you one other thing, because it just it reminded me when you were talking about the uncertainty that all these government policies create. Another thing that's a little bit dropped out of the conversation, uh, but shouldn't have, one great source of uncertainty, and it's government's created uncertainty, is what are the liability rules? that are going to be governing businesses. So if you are a business that is doing your level best to create, to, to protect your employees and to protect your customers and you know, following all the regulations and following best practices, let's say according to CDC, can you still, will you still get sued because somebody acquires COVID and maybe they can show some nexus to you and and convince a jury using some strange new theory that nobody ever thought of to begin with. It seems yeah. to me that is something that's going to inhibit business activity. It's going to inhibit the reopening of our economy. And we can solve that. We don't have to say everybody's immune, uh, you know, even if they're reckless. But what you do need to do is create a safe harbor so that people can know what is expected of them, what they can do, and then they'll be, they won't have to play kind of lawyer lotto. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there were some protections put in place during the special session here in Nevada, but uh, you know, notice that again, going back to the problem, the fundamental problem, which would be uh, public sector unions in my mind, teachers unions lobbied to make sure that schools were not included in those protections. And it was obviously a way to give them a legal opportunity to say, hey, for our liability sake, we can't go back to in-person learning. Um, and I think, you know, as, as we move forward, we try to 
try to fix some of this economic damage that, that has happened, this is the real challenge that we have. We've got these, uh, honestly, political problems that are in the way, these obstacles, whether that be public sector unions or that just be the political makeup of the state legislature or depending on what happens in the national election, we've got those problems as we're gonna be trying to rebuild in our private lives. So I think that one of the biggest things we need to do is make sure that we're focusing conversations on these fundamental underlying issues and not just the kind of top level stuff. Uh, one, one of the key examples that we have is for, towards the unemployment benefits in this state. Our unemployment office really does need to be overhauled because they've demonstrated that they're incapable of dealing with the current challenges in, in this world. Uh, so that's a deeper seated issue. It's gonna take more than just say Governor Sisolak mm -hmm. saying, let's raise taxes a little bit and throw some more money at them. Yeah, well, um, you know, government bureaucracies are often underperforming and, and sometimes it's very, it's very hard to come up with kind of schematic answers for how you get them to perform better. It's some of the hardest work of governance that you can do. Of course, not all of our political leaders have been up to it, yeah. both parties. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move into the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, just a reminder to all the participants, you can uh, enter a question in the chat box. Uh, so this one's from Michael uh, from Bill Herrenberg, uh, asking if you and Nevada Policy will be recommending legislation to limit the power of the, of the governor in these kinds of events in the future. Uh, and do you think the legislature will review the governor's actions after the fact and provide a checkpoint beyond this unilateral action um, because the people feel like they, they haven't had much input. Yeah, we, uh, we haven't had any input. <laughs> it's been, it's been very strange to see how quickly, uh, not just Governor Sisolak, but governors all across the nation have abandoned this concept of self-governance. Um, so yes, it is something that we are gonna be watching. Uh, I know, I believe it was Republican Jim Wheeler who's already put in a bill draft request along those lines. Uh, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest benefits we think that could come of this and maybe something that even Democrats would get behind would be just limiting, again, the duration. So if the governor declares a state of emergency after a set number of days, he would have to get the input of the legislature. Would that have prohibited all the crazy rules and restrictions he came up with? Probably not, because look at the political uh, makeup of our legislature but at least we would have had some sort of a voice and it would have been easier to hold your local representative accountable than a state agent such as the governor. So it would have given us a little bit more, and by us, I mean the average person who is suffering through the shutdown, it would have given us a little bit more muscle in the political process at least. Michael, would you mind my, my jumping in even though that question was directed um, yeah. to you? Uh, it seems to me that the, the sunset idea makes a great deal of sense because the justification for uh, emergency powers being at the disposal of governors is exactly that. You, you, it's an emergency, you've got to act quickly. You don't have time for deliberation. Maybe you don't have time to call the legislature back into session, have a bill become a law uh, the normal way. That justification inherently loses some of its force as time passes. And one of the benefits of putting a sunset and requiring the legislature to renew any such emergency powers and emergency declarations is it defeats the huge power of inertia. It, it forces a rethinking of what emergency measures are being taken as you look at the developing situation and you look at the evidence because we all know inertia can be an extraordinarily strong force. Absolutely. And there's there's a sense, I, I believe, that a lot of lawmakers are kind of happy that this is on Governor Sislak's shoulders and not theirs. Um, if they if they were to be able to step in, exactly like you said, it would force you to get out of the status quo a little bit, rethink things, and you'd have a lot more minds saying, is this actually how we need to proceed forward? So it's absolutely something that we'll be, we'll be looking at throughout the legislative session next year. There's another question concerning the failing and lack of preparedness of our institutions, uh, specifically the military um, that might have been overlooked. Uh, should there be some sort of germ biological 
immigration that might have applied to the situation? So uh, I think that um, there have been extensive efforts by our military um, to research the problems of biological warfare and uh, and develop responses. I'm certainly not an expert in that. I certainly, but it's my impression that they've been doing that. I certainly hope that they've been doing that. A lot of the problems that um, that this pandemic has posed, though, have just been have been hard precisely because it's not uh, an enemy, um, we think, <laughs> um, as far as we know, an enemy that's trying to, uh, to harm us. Um, and, you know, the, it's the novel coronavirus, right? We've been, it has been a new pathogen that we ha have been trying to adapt to and that our, our learning about has evolved over time. Um, so for example, you know, early in this, we thought ventilators, I mean, it was widely thought that ventilators were going to be this huge um, part of our response, that we might have a ventilator shortage. The federal government actually did a decent job of stimulating production and reallocation of our ventilators. And then it has, at, it has turned out that they haven't been extremely useful. Um, they've arguably even been harmful. And there's, and you know, there's. No, I I suspect again, not not being a scientist here here, I suspect that there's not a lot uh, that we could have done about research on other kinds of bio bio weapons um, that would have let us know that in advance. Okay, um, I'm wondering uh, if you can talk about the uh, blueprint for re-energizing the business climate in Nevada and some of the recommendations that Nevada policy has made uh, specifically for economic growth. Yeah, one of the biggest things, uh, the broader strategy is we need to make it as easy as possible for people to get back to work and businesses to reopen. The tangible policy is next year are going to have to be bought because people will make up. And actually have some pretty good winners for example, focus of our. Uh, now, right now, there's we're one of the worst in the nation when it comes to occupational licensing, according to the Institute of Justice. So we're going to be looking at how to reform that so that way people can actually get back to work, even if that means changing careers. Great. And uh, then there was a question about uh, the Article Five Movement Convention of the States. Is there any any support for that uh, in light of of uh, the restrictions that we want on the governors? I mean, my my thought is, you know, being the federalist that I am, I, I like the idea of every state kind of figuring out how they want to proceed with some sort of emergency power. Obviously, I've got my preferred ideas, but. Um, but no, I think it's something that probably has to happen on the state level, specifically specific to that state. I think that's probably the best way to, to tackle it. Also, you're gonna get more buy-in that way. Um, so here in Nevada, the restrictions I would like to see on a governor's emergency powers probably won't all come to fruition, but there will be some incremental steps towards it that we can affect next year, that we can affect right away so we don't get a repeat of this and say, yeah, a, a year or two years. Yeah, I don't think that. I don't think that the the particular question about restrictions on governors is, is best handled by an Article Five convention. There may be other reasons to have an Article Five convention. Maybe there's something that you think um, you could build a kind of supermajority consensus for, but you got to get around the bottleneck of incumbent congressional politicians. Uh, but this, I think, isn't one of them because it's it's an intrastate problem. Okay. Next question. Do you think social unrest around the world would have materialized to the same extent if there were no shutdowns? Uh, and any thoughts about the Antifa movement uh, specifically? Yeah. Um, no, I don't think we would have seen the kind of social unrest that we did. Uh, there's, whether you're looking at the Black Lives Matter movement or any of the other social upheavals that we've had over the summer, a lot of that is kind of, you know, 
it's part of a perfect storm. Uh, you had legitimate concerns about police brutality. You had a uh, news cycle that certainly fed into it, but also people were already frustrated economically. In a lot of cases, they were stuck in their homes. And so socially, they were feeling uh, very anxious. And, and we've seen we've seen a pretty serious increase of uh, mental health issues, even if it's kind of low level, people facing depression, facing anxiety. So with that as a backdrop, it's unsurprising that we've got as much social unrest as, as we do. And that was one of those unseen, unintended consequences of a shutdown. It wasn't just, okay, you can't go to work today. It was, you can't go to work today. And if you are facing suicidal thoughts, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for you. If you have an abusive partner, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for you. And a lot of people dealing with that type of stress, I think found an outlet in going out there and making their voice heard, whatever that voice was. You know, um, I think there's been, uh, we've all seen uh, hypocrisy and people pointing to the hypocrisy from people saying, you know, no gatherings, uh, but oh, if it's an approved cause, then it's fine because the, then the, the, the virus will, won't, won't bother you. Um, and I think that, that one of the ways this has played out is that there was this pent up demand for feeling like part of something, uh, being with other people. And then we created these particular approved outlets where people could do that. And so I do think that that helped to uh, uh, fuel um, that phenomenon because there was so much pent up demand from people being, who were tired of, uh, of, of being isolated. Um, are there any uh, specific government union reforms that have uh, maybe some more broad support from the public in light of everything we've gone through this year? Yeah, the, the big one, and this is one that we're going to be focusing, again, pretty heavily on, is transparency in the collective bargaining process for government sector unions. Right now, when whether it's a teacher's union or a police union or any union, meets with government and negotiates the contract, which sets pay, sets benefits, does all of that, that all happens behind closed doors. Um, so we just making that transparent would be a huge step uh, towards fixing some of these, some of the ways that unions step in the way of progress. Um, I know that we've gotten some support from some unlikely allies. I'm not gonna mention them yet because we're still kind of in preliminary discussions, but thanks to the, the Black Lives Matter protests and everybody upset about criminal justice reform, because police unions are one of the uh, main roadblocks to getting any sort of significant reform, we've been able to talk to some groups about, hey, let's open up their bargaining process so that way the public sees how they're standing in the way of progress. And uh, that's, that's something that might actually have a shot, but I know that it is something, we ran a poll and about 73% of Nevadans, including a majority of union workers themselves, actually agree with this pro uh, pro policy. So it'd be a huge first step. Okay, so uh, that's going to conclude the Q and A. I uh, just want to uh, give some op opportunity for, for each of you to uh, give some closing remarks. Yeah, I'll, um, you know, you, Ramesh, I'll, I'll throw it over to you in a second. I think the the biggest thing that folks need to remember is we are we are facing a lot of varied problems. We're facing economic problems, social problems, etc. Again, this is, this is a huge opportunity for the average person who doesn't attend these webinars, for the average person who doesn't follow politics religiously, to realize, oh, government is having a direct impact on how I'm allowed to live my life. And that recognition as parents realize the mess that is their, their school system, as workers realize the mess that is unemployment, as businesses realize the mess that is the regulatory bodies, that's a huge opportunity to not just get specific policy proposals done, but really start to build a movement towards, let's not let anybody have this type of power over our lives. So there's an opportunity there to really get in and shift the culture uh, that, that has really led us to this type of over-governance. Uh, I, I think that's terrific. Uh, I agree with that. I would just uh, add, one of the things that we are seeing, one of the problems that we have to address and confront is a collapse in public confidence in free markets as a means of achieving social progress. Um, 
it's not actually, if you look at it, everybody talks about the rise of socialism among young people. It's not as much, it's not as pronounced as the decline in faith in capitalism and free markets. And so one of the things that we have to do when we are changing the laws to make it easier for people to go into a line of work, like getting rid of some of these unnecessary occupational licensing reforms, or we're changing the way housing is regulated to make housing more affordable, or changing the way healthcare is regulated to make it possible for people to buy cheap, renewable, catastrophic health insurance policies. All of those things are important in themselves, but they're also important as a way of showing people markets work. The same markets that we rely on to have our phones that we carry with us at all times and do a hundred things we would have never thought about doing 15 years ago are things we can use to solve some of these pressing problems that the socialists say we can only use government intervention to solve. If we don't act in a proactive way on all of those fronts, then I think it becomes much easier to have this kind of beguiling vision where you just say, things aren't working, it must be the fault of capitalism, let's have government ride to the rescue. That is a, a kind of seductive, but ultimately counterproductive kind of thinking. And it's the sort of thinking that institutions like NPRI and NRI exist to counter. Absolutely. So, well, thank you both for a wonderful discussion. Uh, this concludes our regional partnership event between National Review Institute and Nevada Policy Research Institute. Uh, so please remember to register for Monday's National Review Institute event with Andrew Studdeford and Kevin Hassett on the impact of the Biden economic agenda. You can go to nrinstitute.org and click on events to sign up for that. Uh, thank you so much, Ramesh and Michael, uh, for today's discussion, and thank you all for participating.